control and somehow picking up my research where I left it many years ago. And uh, my interests uh, obviously are into uh, decentralized control, as we say, robustness, uh, performance, and so on. So uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, make an introduction about a new approach that I have developed and not present it gradually for CISO problems, single input, single output. A very simple case, and we build up on a stable and invertible, then unstable, <coughs> and from there, we show the example of an uh, application, and then we go to uh, multivariable extension, multi-input input, and we'll show that this method applies very well and allows you to have decentralized control. What do I mean by decentralized control? Imagine you have this building, you have 50 rooms and 50 thermostats. Each one sets the thermostat at a given temperature, but obviously there is a, a leak between the rooms, somewhere 20, somewhere 60, obviously 16 can get hotter, 20 can get cooler because of the interaction. What you would like to get is a situation in which someone gets 16, he, he feels 16, and vice versa for the other one, in spite of the interaction. But simply said, what is decentralized control? So it so happened that this stabilization method gives you, uh, as a bonus, decentralized control. And here again, we just finished an experiment on a drone, a cheap drone, but it was done. You can see simply how our method works or not. And uh, with that, I'll uh, I conclude and I'll speak about some possible uh, direction of research, some of which maybe we may have, let's see. Okay, what do we want in control? We would like eventually to have a system to stabilize, but stability is not enough. Stability enough, we want also fast robust tracking. If we want to, let's say, say to a radar, you know, go to 30 degrees, or like to go from zero to 30 degrees and stop there the fastest possible. But if I want to go too fast, you might simply start to oscillate and maybe get unstable. So you want stability. But you want stability. The problem is stability is not enough. A plane is stable. But the plane burns gas. Therefore, its mass decreases. Therefore, the dynamics, all the interaction. If the system changes, the model is changing. So if the model is changing, you don't want your system simply to kaput. You want it to keep being stable and performing. So you'd like eventually to have somewhere featuring adaptation stability. The word adaptive here might have a different meaning than the adaptive control. With large stability margin, I would like eventually to feel safe enough so that if I have changes in gains and changes in phase, then I, I still will be perform. Robustness can be seen in two ways. Robustness, if I have external disturbances, let's say you have a plane, you have a wind, so the wind is going to deflect the direction, so you would like simply to resist that deflection. And uh, also parametric uncertainties, because the model is changing. The model, you know, is a fiction. We linearize the world because it makes it easier for us. We would like a method which is easy to design and implement, and if possible, to apply it to a family of nonlinear systems. And uh, and as I said before, decentralized control can be a plus. The context. Many years ago, I did some work on optimal sensitivity where H infinity started at the time. H infinity basically is an optimal method of control trying to minimize the gains of the operators that are involved. Much later, I met a Professor Kellerman who showed me that he had a second method, second order system. He had a method in order to make sure that it's both robust and good time performance. And he told me, now you do something, I get something parallel on second order. So we work together on making it on any order. And we find the magic solution. There's a paper, 40 pages in International Journal of Control, uh, where basically we show that not only we get stability, but we get time domain convergence in no time. 
like zero rise time and zero settling time. We thought we found, you know, the uh, Alibaba K. We said it's fantastic. We must, we almost uh, patented it, and then we realized. But in fact, the theorem that we worked worked only when the game goes to infinity, like it's some kind of asymptotical value, which means a beautiful result, theoretical, but not practical. It, it doesn't translate into practice. So I have to think back again of different ways. Unfortunately, Dr. Kahneman uh, died, and uh, I decided to, to start completely different approach, trying to get some of these concepts of variable quasi narrow control, and, and maybe make it with practical games. And that's what I'm going to try to show. I'll consider a very simple uh, system. You have a plant, and you have the output. You have the compensator and unity feedback. I use unity feedback, it's simple, okay? Uh, so this is the input, this is the error system. Obviously, what I would like to do is tracking to have y equal r, that means the output for exactly the input, which means I want a zero error. This one should be zero. So, this translates into very simple equations that the transmission t and the sensitivity. E was the error signal, r is the input, this is the output, this is the input, and you have t. And as you can see from this definition here, you can very well check that s plus t is equal to 1. Which means that the sensitivity operator and the closer operator, when you add them, give you unity. And what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve t equals 1. That means output follows the input. Okay? I'm trying that with my wife, it doesn't work. But it's impossible because we know that practical systems, uh, causal systems, have uh, more poles than zeros. Otherwise, it wouldn't be realized. So those systems, t of s, when s goes to infinity, goes to zero. So if it goes to zero, it contradicts the first one. I want s equal zero, but obviously, when t is equal zero, s becomes one. So there is some kind of contradiction. How do we solve it? We go that way. This is the sensitivity uh, curve here. And remember, s was equal to 1 plus pc. If I'm using high gain, c, s becomes small. So I'm going to use sensitivity and using high gain, lower sensitivity, but at least in the bandwidth of interest. There is a danger, and the danger is that when you decrease sensitivity here, it increases, this curve increases. I believe the Chernobyl experiment was something related to this concept, but they have increased the gain to make tests, reducing sensitivity here, and then creating problems and resonances that simply went uh, unstable. Because this area is equal to this area. How to design a system when I know that this area is equal to this area? So I say to myself the following. I'm going to design a system so that I have minimum sensitivity on the bandwidth of interest. But I'm going also to limit this one, this time to maximum value of sensitivity, limit it, and then the area will be bigger and I'll have a bigger bandwidth. What allows me to do that? I can do that because today, uh, Sensors are so performing, they are very precise. For five dollars, I can buy a, a meter at home that measures to the tenth of a millimeter the distances between walls and so on. So things have changed. The sensors that we used to work with many years ago, they're normal. So they're very accurate, high bandwidth, and we have processing, digital processing, also very fast. So based on that, I'm saying to myself, I'm going to lower this value m, it will increase my bandwidth maybe, but at the same time, at the same time, I have tools that will make this possible.
So this is the ideal sensitivity, 0 and 1. Practical, I'm going to limit to epsilon and to m, m for maximum value, epsilon within the bandwidth of interest. I'm going to explain this curve by taking the simplest, simplest case, something which is both stable and both the both the system and the inversion state. This is a Nyquist. Uh, yeah, what you see here in green is a Nyquist. And uh, what I would like to do is having sensitivity smaller than epsilon. So I will show you in a moment how because I have some graphic tools. But this circle centered at minus one, if greater than smaller than epsilon, guarantees you that sensitivity is smaller than epsilon. And the total Nyquist, if it's outside the circle of M, or of regional of M, guarantees you that you don't go beyond that you have in sensitivity. So the design of stability is based on sensitivity design. So this is my aim. Low frequency outside the circle, and then all frequency outside of the circle. How to do that? Do that by having a compensator, which is basically the three things. Number one, I have a low pass here. Compensator with high gain. I have got high gain, low pass. So, and I have also something in high frequency which makes the system uh, realizable. That means that to make sure you have a power K here, you see K, that make sure that this compensator is realizable. I'm taking note the case of P being invertible. P being invertible, imagine you take C is equal to P minus 1J. That means this, this is the operator. But the J is my choice. I'm choosing the J. Doesn't matter which P it is. So if I have a system, I take the model of P, build the P invert, so I can do that. So, in that case, this and this disappears. I'm living with a low frequency uh, filter that makes sure that I'm outside the sensitive circle of epsilon. I'm having here something which converges faster to make sure that I'm outside the circle of 1 over m. And in between, I have phase circuits. And that is the tuning part. Because when I'm going to implement this and this, I'm going to ensure stability. Performance. And here, I'm going to tune in the time domain what's <coughs> the strength of this system. This appeared in a paper in uh, Automatica 2015. Let me explain this. There's a nice geometric method to show that. Okay, this, can you see? Can we close the light maybe? So, live sunlight. Okay, this is the night wrist, as you can see here. This is the night wrist. This is the P. Yeah, or this is the, you know, PC. This is the open loop. So, what I have here is a vector one. This is P. This vector is 1 plus, plus L, let's say the open, 1 plus L. The inverse is going to be within the over angle of the sensitivity. Sensitivity plus T is equal to 1, because this vector is T, this vector is S. And when i changing the frequencies, I can see the vector T and S, very simple. And I can also play with the value of M, having the circle M and the circle epsilon also. That's, that's the basics. So what do we do with that? This is my Nyquist uh, system. And I'm going to tune my filter so that what is the idea that I want to achieve? If this is a Nyquist plane, I'm going to take minus a half, you see? Minus a half would be a vertical line because the M circles tells you that if you make with E on this line, you make sure that T, the transmission is what you want, the closer is what you want. 
So you would like to have this curve. And we're going to play with all the parameters of Hilbert to get as close as possible to this curve. At the same time, we can see the transmittance, we can see the sensitivity, and also we can see U, which is the input of the process. Because, again, you might have a beautiful design, but if the input of the process is too high, you saturate, and it doesn't help. Therefore, what you'd like to do is play on those to make sure, you see here, this is the value of M, the sensitivity of M, and this is U. So you establish a value of U, and you play with the compensator, so that you get to the minus and a half possible, and you play, and you don't want at the same time to go beyond a maximum value of U, so that you do not saturate. So this can be done by playing, by tuning the filters. It's done very easily, and it doesn't matter which model it is, it works beautifully. So, what I have here, as you can see, is an algorithm that closes later on. But the G2, remember this filter G2, which is intermediate frequencies? G2 allows me to act in this region to make phase circuits so that even here, I'll get something more vertical as much as possible. Which means G2 is a tuning which means to make sure that all frequencies give you T equals 1. That means you have an orchestra, you would like to have the bass and the uh, flute and the violin and everybody arriving at the same time here. here. So that's what I would do. So but I would like to have this, uh, this as vertical as possible. And this can be done with G2. G2 allows you to focus on this. Maybe I'll come back on this here. So we continue. So that's a design, as I say. Uh, I count on two things, uh, having, again, high precision sensors, fat genome processing, uh, G1, G2, G3. This one, a low pass filter will do, and K1 is a high gain. This one is also low pass filter with a given power, and again, to make sure that C is realizable. And here, this is a tuning circuit. And it so happened that when you maintain this epsilon value at low frequency and m value at high frequency, it so happened that this curve, remember the curve that we had on the sensitivity curve, we said we would like to have something smaller than m everywhere and epsilon in small frequencies. But there's many ways to go there. I can go like that. I can go like that, like that. And here, that's where G2 is. So G2, tuning G2, allows you to change this profile, but without touching the epsilon at the end. And G2, usually, when you do it, when you tune it, it basically allows you to tune the time response. Now there's a trick. The trick here is that I can use high gain, and I'm not afraid. Usually, when you have high gain, too much gain, then you get unstable. You oscillate, and maybe you get unstable. If I'm asked you to take your hand like that, and go 30 degrees, you're going to do it. Do it fast, you're going to swing. Faster, you're going to swing more, and eventually you're going to fly. Okay? So, when you increase the gain, you oscillate and disturb it. Now I'm going to show what you get exactly the opposite effect. When you have, let's say, on a Nichols curve, when you increase the gain, but you oscillate because you're getting closer to the critical point, minus one zero, if you want zero degree, 180 degree, here. But this uh, design has a, a given, a given, uh, secret, which is that the gain is related to the frequencies, which means that the poles and the gains are related, so that when I'm increasing the gain, my poles are changing at the same time. Which means, instead of getting closer and closer to zero, I always keep 
avoiding the zero because the world is changing. And what happens when I'm increasing the gain? You see, I'm getting closer and closer. So it's counterintuitive in engineering because usually you want to go fast, you oscillate. Here, no. The, the, the faster you go, the stronger your compensator and the more ideal value you have. And this is what I called, what I said at the beginning, some different meaning of adaptation. Okay. How to do it now for uh, unstable systems? This stage we consider unstable but invertible systems that have some slope uh, bound at the, at the end. So the compensator might look complicated, but in fact, it goes that way. I'm going to consider my plant P decomposed in two parts. One part, which is minimum phase, that means stable invertible, and the second one is unstable. So the first one, I can invert no problem. I cannot invert the second one. You know, when you have uh, a right half length pole, okay, if you want to invert it to the zero, it doesn't work. If we fit a wood locus, you know, but you're going to have a branch going from, if you don't have perfect conservation, you never have, you're going to have a bunch of locus in the right plane, that means you're going to go to zero. Unstable. We cannot cancel the right pole. So, here I invert what's invertible. And I replace the non-invertible by something equivalent to its behavior at infinity only. That means I'm building this function H so that it behaves like P at infinity. High frequencies, P becomes like H. That's all I need. When I do that, then I have my new compensator, P, H minus 1, J, and this will still solve the problem. When we do it, I'll apply it. So this is uh, an experiment we did in McGill, and you have here a ball. This is a standard experiment on which we had many students working on uh, PID tuning for many pieces and so on. So we know that they got the best PID possible and we wanted to compare to what they have. So uh, we have a PC for supply, uh, we have a uh, whole setup for uh, lab view and the circuitry, and this is what we got. We got a system which is unstable. And we increase the gain, and as you see, as we increase the gain, it becomes, we ask the ball to, to jump, and we increase the gain, it jumps faster, and the more we increase the gain, and the faster it converges. I'll show you a very short video on that, but before, let's just uh, uh, go on this. What you see here is the S curve, for different gains, you know, the sensitivity curve. Uh, this is uh, Nicole's plan, uh, uh, Nicole's plane. And in this one, uh, those are the M circles, that means you would like to have close to. That means if this is 0 dB, you would like to play the gains, so but you, you, you get simply tangent to 0 dB curve most of the time. That's what you do on the Nichols chart in order to make sure that you have T equals 1 all the time. But if we pay attention, uh, Nichols chart is PC over 1 plus PC is equal to MT, the transmission. Or if you want L, L over 1 plus L is equal to MT. If I replace L by 1 over L, what I'm getting is simply 1 over 1 plus L which become what? Sensitivity. That means if instead of showing the gain, I'm showing the inverse of the gain, so those curves that you have here do not become t equal 1 curve, but s equal 1 curve, or COdP curve. So you can play on those plates. You can play with Nyquist too. And with Nyquist, you get 
the encirclement, so you have different games, like for instance, you have here a possible region where you have stability. We're going to work within that region and apply compensator in this region. And the theorem always works, but with my twist, we can always add, if we want, two more encirclements so in different directions, but as long as the number of encirclements is fine, I don't mind doing it. But there's no point adding encirclements. This is what we got. It's a new computer, the control button has, has moved. Server, I got it. Server is here. This is on the net. You can see it. Uh, what I just said. And let's look at this. It's a three-minute video. So.
Note also that the rise time and the setting time are equal. If we do compare our uh, compensator to a PID compensator, uh, which has been optimized after many, many trials, uh, we observe the following. Number one, which is quite important. The uh, static error is small, but uh, the setting time is quite big, 650 milliseconds. Therefore, our compensator performs uh, much better. To validate qualitatively the robust test of the system, we're going to hang different objects, different shapes, different weights, and check the result without modifying the compensator. The instant itself. Before we go to the multivariable case, any question so far? Convincing? Oh, I have some questions, but not now. Not now. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Okay, let's go now to the multivariable. We have here a system which is unstable, multivariable unstable. And, uh, but so far, I'm using the fact that property that is inversely stable. Okay. And what I do here is I'm assuming that the system is ultimately diagonal dominant. That means that at higher frequencies the system becomes diagonal. If you remember when we started we spoke about a room uh, and heat exchangers and so on. So obviously when you have slow variations they will affect the second row, but you have swings, very fast swings, because of the galactic mass of the walls and so on, it won't pass as fast as, as the low one. So therefore, this uh, assumption of diagonal dominance at high frequencies uh, makes sense many, many times. And again, uh, that they have some slope conditions at, at infinity with singular value conditions. Okay, before I go on, I was discussing uh, with a uh, professor here two days ago, and uh, I s emailed him this morning a telegram of uh, Davison, 1973, because he showed me a design where he had a diagonal compensator for an unstable system. And I said, that you can't do that in theory, because there's a telegram which I sent him this morning on which we're going to spend some time a bit later. And here I say to myself, we cannot, we would like to use a diagonal computer. It, it solves many problems. People trying to build C, a matrix of C, it gets very complicated because one affects the other. But when you have N compensator and not N square compensator, it's fine. So, uh, Davison said that it's impossible to stabilize an unstable much level plant with diagonal compensation. And here we say, okay, but we're going to use diagonal compensation at infinity only, and then we can use the compensator. So, this is the system, multivariable, and I want to use this one. So, as you can see, the compensator is a relatively simple to build and to use, 
and I'm taking into account the interaction B, and obviously I have Y equal to R, but in fact, the transmission T, this time is not one, but is I, it's identity. Which means, input one affects output one only, input two affects uh, output two only, and so on. So I have this condition at infinity of diagonal dominance, but it is infinity. And this is simply a small game theorem application of diagonal dominance at infinity, but the demonstration is much more complicated than that. But let's build the, the, the system. As before, I'm going to build uh, a function h of this, which has the same behavior as the diagonal part of the plant uh, at high frequency. Uh, this is the unstable part of the plant. So again, the plant is divided into stable and versus unstable. And I'm building something on the, on the diagonal part of the unstable. I'm going to build a function which is function of the behavior of this diagonal part of the unstable one at infinity, just like I did in a single input single input case. Doing that, I build this intermediary function, okay, which happens to be diagonal, stable, invertible, and I apply it in my system. Doing that, I'm getting stability and moreover. Now we're in a multivariable case, which means now, instead of talking about magnitude, absolute values, and so on, we're talking about singular value, which is the infinity norm, let's say, of the system. So S, remember, S plus T equal 1. So the norm of S is equal to the norm of T minus 1. If I minimize the sensitivity below epsilon, epsilon being a number as small as possible, so T gets closer to identity. <coughs> okay. That means I got decentralized control. And local controllers. This is a two by two simulation example. I have interaction and I have diagonal compensators. And I would like simply that R1 controls Y1, R2 controls Y2, and it doesn't matter what the interaction. I'm using a system here. But the solution already. This is a stem which is unstable, but the inverse is stable. I'm building those intermediary function, and again the condition of infinity. I can check that the system becomes the dominant when S goes to infinity, and therefore I can apply the compensator. I apply it using all those methods, separating, taking into consideration the diagonal part and stable part, building this function which will depends on it, and then use it to build H, and using H to build C directly. What are the results? What we now see now, if you look at T, the matrix of transmission, we have T11 and T12, and you can see here that they both 0 dB. That means T11 is 1, T22 is 1. How about T12 and T21? They're 40 dB or 20 dB or 60 dB below. Which means I got really diagonal transmission. What's interesting is that when I look at the time domain, okay, here I choose only for uh, the first element, C1. I choose C1, and this is locating an excellent time response, and this is the interaction. The interaction is basically dead, even in the time domain. I did not uh, optimize the time response for T2. I kept the same T1 just to show you, even like that if I'm having some uniform thing, I get something pretty convincing. But I can also optimize and adjust the J2 
how the second compensator and get something better. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm new to the drones because I never wrote in that, so we decided to go to much variable example. So we found a cheap drone and we did some studies and we got, uh, this is a modeling that uh, you, you all know, some of you are working in the field. And uh, we have a controller, we divide a controller into two, translation dynamics, which are slower and, uh, and uh, orientation dynamics. And uh, we apply there and we decided to compare our controller to H2, H2 infinity by giving them the same objective. That is the same objective, the same sensitivity norm. That means the weightings of H2 and H infinity are done in such a way that in fact we're talking about the same epsilon and the same M for all the designs. And the question now is what do we get? And let me, okay, this is, no, let me use this. Okay, this is what we get. I'll go back to the music synthesis. This is what you get with H2, when you want stationary. Okay. This is what you get with H infinity, and this is what you get with our control. That means our control manages to keep the drone uh, more stable and more stationary. And this is a picture where you see the XY. So the red inside is our uh, compensator effect on the displacement of the drones. Uh, the green is H2, H infinity is the blue one. So it has some value. Let me go back here. We decided to apply the system to compare it to mu synthesis. And doing it in mu synthesis, we realized one thing. That number one, a compensator, the peak compensator reacts much faster. But somehow in the time domain, there's some peaks, very short peaks. And this, we didn't have the time to adjust it yet, the best way to program it. And this is what we get here when we take mu synthesis. You can see that the time here as a big compensator, again, is the same objective. We what we try to keep the same game, the same objective to compare, you know, apples with apples. <coughs> this is a mu synthesis. We introduce some noise and see how high it goes, and the PID, and obviously here we can see that B is better, but again the swing is higher, again the swing is also bigger here than there. Oh, so this one is the same scale, this one in this case is the same scale. The B uh, is not bad, but if I go to the next one, on the angle, this is the response that I have when I'm doing a change in X and Y, this is the effect it's going to have on you on PID and mu delta, but here the scale has changed a little bit. So we get something very stable and so on, but we have something that needs still to be adjusted. But nevertheless, it's encouraging to see that compared to H2, H infinity, we're doing not bad. With mu synthesis, there's something, but I have ways to correct and and this. Our compensator reacts faster for sure. Now, let's look now at the variations of the angles. You have H2, H infinity, and B. And here I have to pay attention when it's the same scale and when it's not, because sometimes I have to, to change. Here's the same scale all over, so that's fine. So you can see here the variations with our controller are much more, much smaller. Here, we get the lift what you get in H2, H infinity, and B. And again, it's, uh, it reacts relatively okay compared to the others. And in terms of uh, RPM, uh, RPM, you get B control RPMs are much smaller than what's needed elsewhere. That's it. 
if I go now to this part, this is the uh, drone that we had, and we use simply the PID of the manufacturer that uh, suggested. Look at the swings. We did the experiment in the same day to have the same conditions. Much less swing than for the manufacturer of the courses. <coughs> so, this is a preliminary work on drones. It's new, but uh, we believe we have something there. So the conclusion, uh, these methods have shown to be stable and robust, and we get a time response with two important properties. We have no overshoot, that's important, and rise time is equal to setting time, which is an important feature also. Okay. Uh, most of the time, the temperature they compare rise times, but in fact, to me, the setting time is more important because setting time is where you really going to have performance. We can apply too much available, we achieve the sample light control, and we can tune the independently the time responses. Where do we go from there? There's many, many ways uh, to extend it. Uh, number one, uh, I'm going to try to do it if I have the time. I'm on sabbatical, but uh, I'm really committed to write two books. But I would like eventually to teach this geometric method in first grade, I mean, undergraduate. Where this is a uh, Nyquist, this is the infinity circle, doesn't matter. That's a Nyquist. I would like to, eat, to have the Nyquist like that. And tuning, tuning the Nyquist can be done directly here. I think I went too, too far with the scale. I'll start again. We can tune the compensator, doesn't matter which compensator we put, PID and in order to get there. Look at this green, green line. This green line is the T, the closed loop. You see here, T is equal to one and zero this frequency, and I can read the frequency here. This program allows you read the frequency. So that means I would like to have T equals one all the time. Number two, if I want to limit my, my gain, C, I write C over C max. I can afford a gain, let's say, of that much. Okay, so C over C max should be smaller than one. So by changing the parameters, I'm changing the, the, the circles, okay? And if I don't want to overshoot, I simply make sure that this curve T equals one doesn't go to T equal one plus something. You know, then I, I won't have overshoots. It's in effect the domain, it has a relation to the time domain. And there's, I can introduce uh, unstable poles and do the encirclements and then play with the games and make sure that I'm getting a good uh, performance by having the encirclements. And it works on any system. So most of the PID experiments that the students are doing to school, 
with this system, they'll be able to tune it much, much faster than, uh, than, than otherwise. That's one thing I'd like to maybe add the time to do, to do it. Uh, but you know, write a procedure and simply take all an experiment of undergraduate and say, try, it, try to tune that way. And it, maybe you feel better tuning when you see the T, when you see the S. Oh, by the way, you have also the S curves, you have the T curve, you have the U curve, that means the input to the plant and so on. Another way to apply it, but this again, I have to go with this with my heart, but I, I was thinking of the L1 adaptive control. Uh, there is a filter there uh, that has been added, which does not affect the relation between output and input, but which affect the relations between output and uh, disturbances, uh, input noise, and so on. And uh, we do it on the with this uh, geometrical method, and we can see that most transmission that between the uh, input, uh, excuse me, the output, and the disturbances can be controlled to be small. And sometimes you have to make, how to say, uh, compromise between two situations. You can do it, but in fact, you can improve rejection of perturbances uh, by tuning the filter, maybe. But again, this is very preliminary, and we can uh, do it again. Uh, number three, uh, the other direction to go to is uh, basically go nonlinear. Nonlinear can do many things. You have the classical methods, you know, the Lurie problem extended to circle criteria and more, uh, on which, you know, the Popov kind of school uh, continue on that and adding this system, which gives you some good results. But obviously, those uh, systems are limited in the sense that you need the uh, finite slope, that you need simply uh, to go by the origin. I mean, the nonlinearity sector should go by the origin and so on. And uh, I'd like to go more and try to combine this with the upper node and to different families of nonlinearities to try to get the best. That's what I'm aiming to. I have a year or so back goal to, to sharpen my thoughts about that. And that's it. Questions for David? So, just questions. I have very many questions, but not now, not today. <laughs> <laughs> we meet. Pleasure, pleasure. Uh, I must say, he wrote the book, and uh, some of the concepts he had there contradict some theories that, like I said before, Davison, but we we need to go through it. And I was very, very interested because his work, some his interests are more or less the same uh, mm -hmm. in many respects. Well, we yeah. Okay. More questions? No, I don't think. Okay. Maybe. You just want to say a okay. question? So, if no more questions, let's then kind of say maybe. And we'll be able to wrap up in the end of the questions. Okay. Well, thank you. Can you Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.